and welcome to Dice and Dudes presents Dudes on Dudes. So will be part of a new set of series that we'll have come out regularly throughout several weeks, giving you some insight on our characters, the campaign, and of course ourselves. Today the dice, or I should say the dudes, will be David, the glorious, marvelous DM, please don't kill my character, and Paul, who plays One Eye. And part of the interview will be played by me, Sonia, or Cher. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. Hey, how are you doing today? Good, good, good. I'm going to start with our first question. When did you all start playing D&D? I'll let my illustrious uh, fellow bearded man answer first. My first D&D game was with a horrible GM <laughs> named Jeffrey, and it was in 1983. I'm so sorry that you had a horrible name. Uh, How bad was it? Well, it was one of those tables that it was the players and the GM were adversaries, and the players always lost. Ooh. So, I uh, stayed for two sessions, and that's where my two-session rule came. I'll give any GM two sessions. <laughs> it's like a two-date rule. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I started playing at nine years old. Uh, the first character I am was a fighter. I convinced uh, my stepfather at the time to let me play with a bunch of older gentlemen. I remember the first night that... I played D&D, what really solidified it for me was these 30 to 40 year old men sitting around this table could not figure out a simple riddle that when they hand it to my nine year old brain, I figured it out in like 10 seconds and was like, because they had, they had a map to like a secret room and they're like, oh, we have this, but we don't know what it's to, like, we don't know what it's for. And we had this other map of the keep that we had, that we had taken over for a while, you know, or they had, I was a brand new character. So I see it in my character, you know, we're, we didn't play role play as well as we do now back then, but I grabbed the map, I looked at it, and I was like, hey, that looks like a parapet. And I lay, lay, I put it over, we showed it up to the light, and went, hey guys, look, the secret door's right here, and I keep. <laughs> and then from then on, like, I've, so, I've been playing since then, and that was in 1991. Wow. Yeah. So, they have a, quite a bit of experience. Uh, first, uh, I started DMing when I was 12, too. <laughs> So what about you, Paul? When did you start DMing? My first game that I ran was a old system in the '80s called Rips by Palladium Press. I love that one. It's a good one. And I love it, and I hate it. Yeah. Uh, skill system, <laughs> yeah. I love. World, I love. Combat yeah. system, <laughs> it's terrible. I hate. Yeah, yeah absolutely it's, terrible. It's pretty shit. D uh, D may not may have its faults, but thankfully at least combat may not be the most interesting, but at least it's functional. It, it works. works you, know? <laughs> you can have fun with it, you know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like oh, we're gonna have a combat this session. Oh, we're gonna have a four and a half hour session today. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, that was riffs. Oh yeah. As we saw from our last session. I'm happy with my answer. How about you, Paul? You good with your answer? Yeah. All right. All right. Bring on the questions. Okay. All right. So this will be for both of you. Well, mainly for Paul first, and then we'll get to you. What was inspiration for One Eye? Um, I wanted to play someone drastically different from who I am. Mm -hmm. So, so One Eye is going to be a little shit. <laughs> <laughs> kind of already is. And yes. I'm, I'm playing him that way. Yes, I can say this from... Stories from my character. Yes. Uh, and you know, I, yeah. I'm horrible with accents, so I'm just having fun and trying to hone in on one accent, have fun with it, and not really care if I sound like an idiot or not. Well, you sound great. Honestly. So far, you're doing great. You like. sound fantastic. So it sounds great. <laughs> Sorry, some technical difficulties right there. That would be Kyle playing the role of our producer today. Thank yes. you, Kyle. Thank you for that, Kyle. We love you. You're a valuable member of this team. <laughs> yes, you are. David really loves what, you. What would we do without you? <laughs> Anyways, so David, what was inspiration for the campaign setting? Oh, for the setting itself. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, I've been DMing a long time, and I've DMed Viking campaigns. I've DMed, you know, to you know, traditional epic fantasy campaigns, Lord of the Rings style, like very much like our last campaign was very much epic fantasy style. I've done a bunch of uh, steampunk stuff. I've done a bunch of cyberpunk stuff. I've done, I've done, I've run the gamut. The one thing I've never really run is is a, a western, you know, wild west stuff, you know, cowboys and Indian style. Uh, so I decided to take that and take kind of American history and turn it on its head, give it uh, uh, some different connotations. Uh, like the world of in in my world, you know, there may be parallels to the American Indian, but the world of in, they fought back and they weren't ravaged by disease as much as the American. Indian. Like with with magical healing, you know, simple, you know, accidental germ warfare isn't as just utterly powerful as it is in this world. So they they stood much more of a chance. And where uh, the you know the Easterners when they came to the to the continent, they brought te more technology and stuff with them. Well, they there was magic here. Magic was much stronger here than where they came from. So it was an even fight basically. Uh, yeah, I wanted to run a world that had the sensibilities of the Wild West, where you didn't really know who to trust. Uh, you constantly had shifting alliances and shifting loyalties. Uh, you had that idea that you can't just walk up to anybody and start shooting your mouth off because they may just shoot you in the face. You yeah. know, like it it creates a whole different parallel, you know, uh, to what we had in our last campaign. And I wanted to make it very, very different from our last campaign. For three and a half years of epic fantasy, you know, sometimes you need to change the pace. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Everyone's great, but no, Ever Eberron is my favorite produced world like Keith mm -hmm. Baker's fantastic love it uh, I love the Baker's Dozen concept that he put in there absolutely love it it's my favorite campaign setting next to my own the, this homebrew it, with this campaign has officially become my favorite of any homebrew I've ever run like I said let's go into the next question of do you prefer to run pre-generated campaigns as opposed to homebrew content well that depends uh, if I'm going to run something like uh, let's say Adventure League you know, or if I'm going to run something in a game store, and something like that, I would much rather run a pre-generated thing. You know, the something that uh, I can read, but I can still kind of mess with, you know, and, and move, move things around, but still have that basis. So it's easier for me to get the game going, and I don't have to put in as much work as this, because this is almost a full-time job. I mean, yeah. with the terrain creating, the you know, the writing for it, the way I have the the, the style of this campaign, it's. There's no big bad end game already, you know, like by the time we were at this point in the previous campaign, you guys had already heard about Shroud, he was already the bad guy. And he was the bad guy for three and a half years, you know. Like we even completely changed the Curse of Shroud story to make him the bad guy for the entire campaign up until twentieth level, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. Right now, your guys' choices are what's informing everything that's happening. So I'm having to really keep my, my finger on your guys' pulse to see what you guys want to do and having to react to that. I don't want to do something like that for like a game store. Yeah. So it really depends. This, I'd rather do homebrew. I love homebrew. Homebrew is my favorite. But if I want to run something else, a secondary campaign or something, or some one shots, I love pre generated stuff. I'd love to run a, the Call of Cthulhu Mask of Nyarlathep campaign because it's literally three books or two books and handouts. It's all right there for me. All I would have to do is read. Before like the game session that I run, and I, and I'm happy. That one I probably wouldn't even take creative license with. I'd run it as close to the book as I could do it. Very nice. What about you, Paul? Which one do you prefer? Um, when I run games, I will start out with the intention of running a module, mm -hmm. but it always turns into my version of the module. So I think that's the best way to do it, though. You know, I'm I'm very. Very much, if I as a GM don't like it, I change it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's probably for the best, though. Which I played with you. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I like that. I like yourself. So, yeah. But I like both of you. Always. Great. Okay, so, Paul, do you have a favorite moment in this current campaign so far? I think there's a couple moments. Um, I know. <laughs> uh, when I get to have fun mm -hmm. and say the wrong thing <laughs> I really enjoy that um, saying the naughty words in church was fun <laughs> um, 
visiting the whorehouse, but not for the whores. <laughs> and Breaking everyone, all the stereotypes. And, then, and then everyone thinking I was going there. Multiple for the times, yeah, yeah. Multiple for the times for the whores. I enjoy that dichotomy. For the whores! <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that have yet to be revealed mm-hmm. about the work I've done for his backstory. And just knowing they're there and I have I have the authority and the freedom to get with David in the background and just have things happen off the of camera I'm enjoying that a lot and things have already happened some of you have already gotten hints of it so but that's also one of the, the fun things about this campaign so far is no one is just coming up and like, hey, here I am. My name is Luke and here is my backstory. You know, like, no, it's since you guys don't inherently just trust each other, it's we that really you guys really don't. <laughs> like, I mean, which I, I'm getting a don't. kick out of. I am really getting a kick out of. But it's that, that it's a steady drip of backstory as opposed to like a deluge of it, which mm-hmm. I, I think is fantastic. I love the long game when it comes to stuff like that. Because. It mattered a lot more when we'd been playing for a year and suddenly found out that your previous character's name, Triswin, or Riswin, that's not her name. And she ran away from home. Like, that, no one knew about that for a year. And when they find out, it's like, literally, what? Wait, what? What? What is your name? What the hell? We've been playing a year! Like, I've known you forever! And people were mad at you. Like, you're like, I've been your friend forever. Why wouldn't you tell me that? Like, that's the type of stuff I love. I love to see that. And the only way you can get that is time. It's the only way that that's going to happen. So what's your favorite moment? As a DM just watching us and seeing how we react with each other or anything? Well, I think my favorite thing about the campaign right now is how much you all as a group push for the character interactions. I mean, last game session is a great example. I had three combats ready to go. Yeah. I mean, ready, <laughs> set up, ready to throw to, to, to throw down and have some fun with that. And you guys role played, which is great. I love that. I I prefer the role play, but I don't have to poke and prod you guys to talk to each other. You're immediately like. Oh, so what's the the watch order? Oh, I'm gonna get on this watch because I'm gonna talk to that son of a bitch. That's what's gonna happen here, you know. Like I'm gonna have a conversation, you know. Like I don't care if I have to follow her around the damn camp, you know. <laughs> or like I'm gonna come up and like Fion, what the hell? Like what are what's going on? Like what's up with you, you know? Or Gunner and and Darius coming up and being like, hey Darius, um, you need to get your shit together, you know. Like like I love that stuff. It's unprompted. It's you guys doing it. The last campaign, you guys were really good at role-playing with the NPCs, and were less so with each other, but it's also because your guys' backstories were so intertwined to each other. It's like, well, I mean, what are you going to say? I mean, you're going to say the same thing you've said a hundred times. Like, don't worry, we're going to make it through this, you know, yada, yada, yada. You know, I like the drama that's building because you guys don't trust each other, because you guys don't know each other, and you guys don't have that intricate backstory that weaves you all together, like a brother and sister, you know, like from the previous campaign. Yeah, our characters are not like that this time. No, no, no I, I think they're about as opposite as they can be this time. <laughs> now, speaking of which, I have uh, I w- personal but, okay, Well, well I, I, would, I, I will have to say for my favorite moment, it's not my favorite moment, it's my favorite character. And I love Valene. Yeah. She was an off-the-top-of-my-head character, and she has become such an integral part to the campaign that it... I love that. That I love when I when I can just throw something against the wall. Like, yeah, I already had her name picked out. I knew what she was, but her entire nothing existed about her besides the what little information she could give me, yeah. and everything else was just built on the fly. And I'm literally jotting down notes, <laughs> you know, about her as I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. And there's so much still more to her than met the eye that even I knew was going to come up. That's been my favorite thing so far. Yeah. It's just that that in that created so many. Very interesting interactions with you guys, but so that that's mine. I'll stop rambling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I was saying, Paul. Yes. My personal question I wanted to ask because we did have a great relationship last campaign as brother and sister, and we did awesome with that. I like that. And this time it is very different because we were not. Some people don't know we were not allowed to talk to each other. We yeah, everybody creates their characters in a vacuum. We did not know. I'm surprised they didn't have Bob Clerics this time. 
I'm like, but why does one I want Cher to like him so much? <laughs> Well, if you look at the party dynamics mm -hmm. over what, day nine sessions? Uh, Eleven. Eleven sessions? Okay. Um, the very first session, my character made more money than he saw in a long time. Ever. And then within two weeks, my character made more money than he made on the yeah. train ride. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a self-serving thing. He wants to keep this engine going. And I think I've expressed that in game oh, yeah. multiple times. Uh, not only to cheer, but also to your partner in crime, mm -hmm. Kalith. Alec. Alec. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Even just, he doesn't say his name right. It's so it's so close to another D and D character. Yeah, name. very famous D and D character's name. Uh, but it's not. But it's not. But it's not. Uh, you know, he's trying to get this group to a point where they can work together, and in his own way, and his own fallible way, he's trying to do that. It seems like you're trying extra hard, or he's trying extra hard for cheer. Well, yeah. Well, you've also given him the most traction, you know, or, or the most friction, I should say, when it comes to we the talk, working together. Well, I should say he talks at her. Well, you guys didn't have a real conversation until, what, nine, ten episodes? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? So, I mean, but that's 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 good. I mean, that's interesting. You know? I mean, he did it with And Darius obviously he is secretly Draven. in love with her. I mean, we, we found that out last <laughs> last <laughs> session. <laughs> Darius and Draven, he did a lot to yeah. get them on board for this venture. Mm -hmm. He's looking at is it as a, as a lucrative business, advent, business venture. That's the... Motivation that I've been playing. Oh, okay. All right, it's fine. And if the other idiots can't see that, then he'll just, uh, he'll just let them Steve. figure it out. <laughs> no leering ones from the other idiots. <laughs> Are you sure it's not love? <laughs> like I'm saying, like I say, I, he's a little shit. Yeah. And they're both little shits together. Just. Just different different smells. Basically, yes. Right. <laughs> Thank you, so. All right, and so for both of you, why do you enjoy, or what do you enjoy most about being able to play D&D? I'll go first. Sure. Um, I think it's uh, it allows me to deal with certain things in life that I would normally never do. I mean, if Say I see a guy on the street, and he's a pimp, and he's beating up his hoe. I, I'm just going to, oh, turn the corner, oh, that's your problem. But my player would probably go over and intervene. So you can, you can deal with situations you wouldn't deal with in life. You can explore different areas of social interaction. You can be someone different. I'm a 40-something fat white male. I can be a... I can be a dwarf. I can be a halfling. Uh, I can be, instead of uh, socially awkward to women, I can be a suave and debonair gentleman in roleplay. Uh, the sky's the limit. Oh, for me? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, Probably the thing I like most about it is that I can work through my stuff, you know? Like everybody's got their stuff. Everybody's got their things, you know? And for me, this is a, a time for a few hours a week. I get to sit down. I don't have any problems. There's no stress. There's no bills that need to be paid. There's no work that needs to be done. It's having fun with my friends, you know? Uh, yeah, we've added cameras to the thing, which is added... Actually, not nearly as much stress as I thought it was going to to me. You know, uh, like apparently this is what I should have been doing for the last few years because I, I really enjoy it. It helps me up my game as much as humanly possible. But, yeah, I, I've been coming back to D&D for years because I've got my problems that I've had in my life and D&D has always been a way for me to work it out, you know, and just get it 
work through my stuff, get it out on the table. If I'm having a bad day, you know, or a bad week, I know I can come in here and just having, you know, the laughing faces of my idiot friends sitting around this, this table, having a good time with me, you know, flailing at, at the, the very simple uh, puzzles I put in front of you guys just makes me feel good, you know? <laughs> I get a lot of looks from the peanut gallery. Right? But, uh, yeah, not not to get, you know, too touchy-feely with it, but yeah, like, without d and I have no idea where I would be. It is really what it comes down to. It's a creative outlet. It's an emotional outlet. You know, it's a, it's a safety thing. Uh, I love doing it. I can... I can be the asshole that I uh, that I don't that I not normally am in life. You know, I can have characters you know that are just utter pieces of dog shit. You know, um, terrible human beings. I can live out all my vicarious fantasies of walking up to drivers in traffic and just punching them repeatedly in the face because they don't know how to drive. You know, like that. All I can focus all of that into D and D, and I don't have road rage. You know, I don't get into fist fights anymore. I don't do that that, that stuff. You know. I don't do I don't do any of that. So it's really D and D. It's it's not a game anymore. It has been for me for a long time. For me, it's it's a part of my life. So yeah, that's why I keep coming back. Okay, so Paul, yeah. Paul, yes. Just curious. Why is, did one eye choose to be a hunter? Is there like something that you can tell us because I know you can't reveal too much. Yeah, yeah I'm watching you here. <laughs> Second level is looming. <laughs> well, um, I'm not at liberty to say at oh, this point. Okay. So it'll be revealed. Yeah, that's part of the unknown parts of one eye. Okay. As long as Trude doesn't see other parts. She'll probably see all parts. <laughs> no! All the parts. Uh, well, technically, he doesn't want to use the communal baths that they use here in Tethys, so, so he likes a private bath. So you might be okay. You might be okay. Hey, Cheryl only went in the one time and had a bad experience. <laughs> she got well, She needed the base. She definitely needed the base. She wasn't that bad. <laughs> so, D-Bay, Talk to me about Brownwater. I know it's very unique, but yet very familiar in its construction and everything. Well, for the for the the last campaign, uh, the group was gallivanting around all of Eberron, you know, and even you know, even the elemental chaos, the Feywild, the Shadowfell. I mean, you guys were everywhere in the last campaign, and there wasn't really a time, even when you were in Barovia, you were still running all over Barovia. You know, you didn't stay in the village of Barovia. You didn't stay in Velaki. You know, what I mean, you guys traveled all, crisscrossed uh, around that place. So I wanted to create some. Thing, uh, that could give you guys a center, something that you guys would want to come back to. It's your guys' choice. If you guys decide to leave Brownwater before I'm ready for it, well, that's your all's choice. That is the style of game that I put in front of you. But I'm trying to make Brownwater so enticing that you don't want to leave until you feel like you're ready to leave, until you've pretty much exhausted the, the stories and things that you have. Like, there are six major plot lines and 12 minor plot lines that are in brown water that I've cataloged, that I have currently running. Of those, only two major plot lines and one minor plot line has the group even picked up on. So, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot in brown water. There's a lot of characters. You got, you know, Marigold Creole, you know, I hope she feels like a real character to you guys when you see her. You know, I'm not. I'm not Matt Mercer. I'm not Travis Willingham. I can't do the voices that they can. I try. I do my best to, to give every every character a unique cadence of speaking of that. But I hope by the way my mannerisms and my actions that you can when I start getting into a character, you guys can see like, oh yes, it's that character. Like I know that character. I want to be involved in that character. Like you have Elise. That's a very interesting character. You guys have Sparkfire. That's an interesting character. You know, you guys have um, you know Norris and his son Tomlin and his daughters Tilsa and Matt. You know, like these are becoming people that you guys talk about even when they're not around. You know, you still mention them. Like, I I, I think having this living microcosm of adventure swirling around you guys gives you a reason to want to stay. It gives you a reason to want to be in brown water. So brown water is like some people have mentioned like, oh, it's like Deadwood. Yeah, sure. It's got parts of Deadwood in it. 
but it's also got parts of, believe it or not, the Shire in it. It's got parts of Gondor in it. You know, it's got parts of uh, of uh, Edoras in it. You know, mm -hmm. like it's got all these moving parts around it. You have the Squatter's Plot. You have the city proper. You have Vigor Ridge around it. I mean, and just not just Brownwater. You have the region around it. I mean, for all of your time that you guys have spent in Brownwater, you've been around Brownwater a lot too. You know, you guys have been to Vigor Ridge. You guys have been to Lock Run Mine, to Creole Ranch. Now you guys are heading into the canyon to the to the west or to the east. That's not even named. No, people just kind of stay away from there. You know. And you guys are now beginning to see why people can't tend to give it a wide berth. Like, this is a dangerous place. You guys are in the last bastion of humanity, as far west as you can get, until you start running into Wildeven lands. Once you hit Haven's End, the mountain range of Haven's End, that's all Wildeven after that. So it's a dangerous, dangerous place, which means it's ripe for opportunity. I mean, it's a perfect place for somebody like One Eye or Cheer or Dakin or Bacon. Gunner, you know, any of those people. You know, it's a great place for all of you guys to collect up and have these adventures. Now, eventually you guys will move on from Brown Water. Brown Water will not be for the entire campaign. It can't be. Eventually your choices will take you away from it. But for, I want it to feel like even when you guys finished adventuring, maybe a couple of you would be like, you know what? Brown Water's my home now. I want to. I want to move there. I want to live there. I would love that if that happened, like how it kind of happened in the previous campaign. But you guys didn't really have a particular home. Your home was wiped out. Yeah. The the one place that you guys had really settled down in was wiped out at the end, and you guys helped to rebuild it. But mm -hmm. I mean, still most of the most of the group did not settle down there. They kind of you guys scattered. This if I, if I even had one or two people just go, you know what? I'm gonna go have a drink with with uh, you know Tomlin and Norris, and I'm gonna build a house in Brownwater, and this is where I'm gonna retire. You know, yeah. Yeah, if, if even one person, I'd say Brownwater has been a success. I think it's been successful so far. I mean, 11, uh, 11 episodes in, and you guys barely can see beyond the horizon of Brownwater at this point, which I think is a good thing. Is that good? Good answer. I think okay. it's good. All right. Do you have any questions for each other? Uh, well, he kind of so, sort of answered the, the question I had for him already, because uh, I was, like, obviously I know a lot more about uh, the, the theory that is one eye, you know, like the potential that is one eye, but I get to see one eye at the table, that's the character, like, that really sticks in my head. It's not all the other information, it's one eye at the table. So, the question I was going to ask, that, that I wanted to know was... Besides Gunner, is there anyone that One Eye already is beginning to trust? No, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> not yet. But it seems like you got a pretty good relationship with Darius. I mean, he bought him a coat. You know, he gave him some clothes. But that could also be like, please put some fucking clothes on. You know, well, no, all of these are strategic actions. To get everyone in the direction of building trust. Okay. So you're trying to be the catalyst that's making it happen. Yes, I'm trying to... I think multiple people are trying to build trust, but everybody's going about it in cross-purposes, which is hilarious. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But uh, I, I like the fact, 11 episodes in, you guys don't trust each other yet. And I think that's the way it's going to be for a little while. It is very different from the last time. Because the thing is, once you guys even trust each other, it's going to be like, I trust you. I'm still not going to tell you who I am. You know, I'm still not going to tell you my back. Like, like, I could see that happening. Like, stuff still coming up, you know, months down the line, you know. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. My thing is, I'm still so giddy right before the cameras roll every time. So nervous, so giddy, so excited to see what happens each game session. And you guys keep surprising me by going, like, combat? Nah, I want to have a conversation with this guy. All right. And that's great. I absolutely love it. I mean, you guys are gonna have a fight in this next uh, episode. You know, you're gonna, you guys are still, a fight has this. been thrown in your direction. We'll see if you can talk your way out of this one. You guys have talked your way out of a lot more stuff than I thought you guys were going to. I thought we were gonna have a big fight against Alara Hell and his man. I thought you guys were gonna have a bigger fight and have the captain against you in the last episode. Like I thought it was just gonna be like, you know what? No, fuck it. We're throwing down the gauntlet, just guns blazing. You know, like kill everybody. Well. But, uh... Uh, it, it, luckily, the, the one eye wasn't in th that lead up. See, the thing is, though, I don't think one eye would have escalated as much as Darius did. I think one eye would have looked for the opportunity, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah and then like, okay, like we're gonna interrogate yeah. this guy. Like, let, let, like let's do that. And then like you guys get him into the room. And then when I was like, you know, like I could see well, that. Well, 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 when I hate slavers oh, we, with a passion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most of the group does, which which is what why I love a menace. A menace to me is very much like what I think America is. It, it, in its heart, America? you know, like what America truly is in its heart. Not maybe through most, some of Not some the of United our actions, States of America, but America. America. <laughs> but like that's how I, because like, you know, slavery. You know, absolutely hate slavery. It's yeah. a vile thing. Taking away anybody's free will like that. A cult is a terrible freaking thing. You know, like I hate that. You know, but at the same time, you also have like the Church of Sabbath. That is a huge part of a menace, you know, like, so it's, it has that same kind of, you know, like we want the separation of church and state, but, you know, our founding fathers, you know, we're all very religious people, you know, like, I love to have that dichotomy, you know, with everything that, that that's being made, like, well, we're very, we're very, you know, rational, we're law abiding, and we do this and that, but, you know, oh, but hey, Sunday? We're all closed, you know, you know, like, you know, we're not open oh, on Sundays, church. you know, there's no government buildings, you know, all government services are closed down. You know, it's that same yeah. thing, you know, like, and I, like I said, I, I just hope that the world itself currently feels new and exciting. And I love the yeah. fact that since it's homebrew and I put you guys in like a fish out of water story for each of you, I can very organically add in the elements to get you guys really, truly immersed in the world and not just like, here's an information dump memorizer. So, yeah. Any questions for David? That you can think you can get some information out of him? No. <laughs> I'm a vault. <sighs> no, David, th that's not David's job. David's job is to set the left and right boundaries in the floor and the ceiling and let us have, have fun in it. So I don't really have any questions for him. I just, I just have to use the time that's given to me I mean, seven peeps a lot for a, a table, so I I'm just trying to use the time given to me, and then give other people the time that they have. I think everybody's got a pretty good spotlight so far. Mm -hmm. It's like this. Even the little things are big. Even the little things stick out now. Like we don't have multiple conversations going on at the tables. You know, we have to focus on each conversation. I think I like that. You know. Gives a little bit of insight. Yeah. And even the people who aren't there, I mean, you can watch the interaction and you can get a sense of like, okay, well, they may be acting differently now that that information's out. So maybe I would interact with their character a little bit differently. You know, it's it's an interesting thing. Like the way that we do this is I don't I don't use a whole lot of like secret information. You know, I don't do a lot of whispers, you know, uh, not really. Not I mean, sure. uh, most of the information that you guys have, i would given you, like, he could turn around and go, like, okay, guys, here is the A, B, and C of my entire, you know? Like, he could do that if he really wanted to, you know? Or Dakin could come out and be, like, guys, I've, I'm secretly a woman, you know? I have been the whole time. You know? and, like, he could do that. That's, you know, that that's his. Can you feel that well, I can feel it. I, I can feel it. Uh, but that, that's his, that's the, the player's prerogative. And yeah. I like the fact that you guys have decided that, no, you know, you guys aren't going to just throw everything on the table and, and see where it falls. You guys are going to slowly move through it. I like that. I like it a lot. Well, thank you both very much for coming out for this. Well, th thank you, Ryan. This dudes on dudes. Yes, All right, dudes I on like dudes. It. Please stay tuned for further parts of the Dudes on Dudes Chronicle. <laughs> thank you for watching Dice, on er, Dice and Dudes and Dudes on Dudes. And how do you say it? Keep rolling the dice. Keep rolling the dice.